Hello, Augies Worldwide. I'm Dave Kastler, amateur radio call sign KE0OG, here with another episode of Ask Dave. Today I'm responding some, to some questions from yesterday's video about the ionospheric sounder that appeared in the waterfall that I showed. And several asked what it was, how does it work, and so on. So that's what we'll explore today. The ionosphere and how it's measured. And of course, I can't be satisfied with the simple answer. We'll look at a little history and some people too. Let's get to the charts. We're going to talk about the ionosphere and ionospheric sounding. This came from uh, this uh, particular picture in yesterday's video. Uh, this dotted line right here on the waterfall. Now the part that's at the bottom is the oldest and the part that's at the top is the newest. So what we have here is a little something that is sending something out, waiting a bit, sending something out at a higher frequency, waiting a bit, sending it at a higher frequency, and so on. And it comes up through the waterfall pretty doggone fast. On any given channel, it just sounds like a whoop. And that is the sound made by an ionospheric sounder. It's starting out at low frequencies, way low, and going up to about uh, 20 megahertz or so. Uh, it's called an ionospheric sounder, sometimes an ionosond. And uh, this is a form of radar. We're trying to uh, look at the ionosphere. Let's see what the ionosphere is. We recall from our studies that it's a layer of the upper atmosphere from about 50 to about 300 miles. Uh, not much atmosphere up there, but the uh, stuff from the sun, the crud from the sun, particularly uh, the ultraviolet rays, will cause the atoms in here, uh, would cause the electrons to become disassociated from the nuclei. Okay, so what this does is create a lot of free electrons and a lot of ions, and then all of that swirls around in the Earth's magnetic field. The uh, positive will go one way and the negatively charged will go another way. Now, we see in radio here that if the frequency is too high or the angle is too high, it'll go right through the ionosphere. If the angle is right, it'll come up and be refracted down to the ground. Now, this particular uh, figure shows a Pedersen ray, which uh, goes up and then uses the ionosphere as a kind of a waveguide, a duct, and brings it back out somewhere out here also. Now, by the way, a single radio wave from a transmitter can take multiple paths to, rec to uh, be received at a uh, listening station. These multiple waves will sometimes cancel and sometimes reinforce each other. And that's what leads to fading. Let's look at the official layers of the ionosphere. In the daytime, we have the D layer, which is fairly low on the ionosphere, 50 to 70 miles, something like that. And there's actually still quite a bit of atmosphere there. And when that layer gets um, ionized, instead of refracting waves, it actually has so much there that it will absorb them. This is why during the day, bands like 80 meters uh, don't work very well because they get absorbed in the D layer. The E layer can be a little bit kind of sporadic at times, but it's both a day and a night thing. Now the F layer up here, the F1 and the F2 around sunset uh, merge into the F layer and then around sunrise split into the F1 and F2 layer. The F2 layer is the one that is highest uh, and thus the single hops can go the farthest. So we got to bring in our mad scientists, right? Uh, the two people who discovered the uh, ionosphere, actually uh, what they called the Kennelly heaviside layer, is actually the E layer of the ionosphere. But let's look at these two guys. Uh, Arthur Kennelly was an uh, American 
And he discovered this about the same time that Oliver Heaviside, who was a polymath who definitely marched to the beat of his own drummer, uh, he postulated uh, the ionosphere itch at the same time. For a while, the ionosphere was named after the two of them, the heaviside Kennelly or Kennelly heaviside layer. Turns out it's actually the E layer that they were uh, postulating. So what about the F layer? Well, I don't know if Edward Victor Appleton was a mad scientist. He looks pretty conventional in this picture right here. He proved the existence of the F layer of the ionosphere, and he did it in 1927. The way he did it was used a BBC transmitter that was in London and very, very carefully listened to what was going on while he was, I think, in Cambridge. And as the sun set, the F1 and F2 layers merged. And as they merged, he could hear the weirdness in the signal that showed that it merged because he was not only getting the direct wave, or I should say ground wave, uh, from the BBC transmitter, but he was also getting a reflected wave. And so you get that interference uh, in between them. Uh, it turns out that New Zealand's uh, Mike Barnett, uh, who was both a physicist and a meteorologist, and thus very interested in the atmosphere, uh, is involved in this. And the Appleton-Barnett layer is what today we call the F layer of the ionosphere. By the way, he won the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1947 for his 1927 proof of the existence of the ionosphere. This is typical of the Nobel Prize. It is often given many years after the groundbreaking work that was done because the Nobel Committee wants to make sure that the work stands up. And obviously it does right here. Now note here, of course, that the F1 and F2 layers at sunset merge into the F layer. And this is what he was measuring. And he was far enough away to know that the E layer was not responsible for that propagation. Now, given that we depend heavily on the ionosphere for communications, people have been studying it hard. And the way it is studied is with an ionosond, okay? It's a radar. Uh, you've got a pulse transmitter with a frequency range of 1 to 20 megahertz, okay? And this goes up, actually, it says vertically but it's gonna go out at an angle. Now that's important for later on. Controller and data processor, and then there's a receiver here that receives the echo signals from the, uh, from the ionosphere. Here's a picture of a, a ionosond made by a Canadian company. It's got the transmitter and receiver, and it will show you its results. Now, um, there's also the antennas. Here's a transmitting antenna back here. Here's a couple receiving antennas right here that uh, are used. Basically, they receive from straight up, okay? So there are stations in several different networks. This happens to be the uh, uh, HERO network or GIRO or whatever you want to call it. It's a university network and it has ionosons all around the world that participate in this particular network, sending their information so that they can get kind of a worldwide view of what the ionosphere is doing at any given time. Let's take a look at this. This is the output of an ionosond. This one's at Lowell University, a digisond, okay. This is the picture. Let's look at it. This are megahertz here, one through 10 megahertz in this instance right here. This is miles uh, let's see if it's miles or kilometers. 
Knowing science, this would probably be kilometers. But it's above the Earth. So you can see the reflecting layer right here. Now remember I said that it kind of sprays in multiple directions, okay? And so you're going to get a little bit of this sprayed up and sprayed back. But this is the actual reflection. Now this black line is a computed plasma frequency or electron uh, density versus true height, okay? This is calculated from the strength of the responses. So if you go to three megahertz, you've got the same electron density here as here, four, it's a little higher, and you get up to just under five and there isn't any. So this is your maximum usable frequency right here, okay? Uh, because you go above this, your electron density just cuts down to nothing. Now, and, and you can see the maximum usable frequency concept right there, that signals that are sent up into the ionosphere at higher frequencies are just not coming back. These right here are the second time around ones. You send up a pulse, and it goes up here, and you get that response. Meanwhile, the pulse keeps going. And um, so the second time around is the previous pulse comes in here. Now, this talks about what are called ordinary waves. Red points to the locus of the received ordinary frequencies. Okay, and the green is the extraordinary wave. Now, if you would like to know the difference between those two, I will tell you. When you send a linearly polarized signal up to the ionosphere and it bounces, you get two waves coming back down that are refracted differently. The ordinary wave is the one we think about, but it's circularly polarized. It's no longer linearly polarized. And the extraordinary wave, which actually is refracted differently in a different direction, called the extraordinary wave, is circularly polarized the other way. So does this mean that whenever we receive radio waves off of the ionosphere, that they are always circularly polarized? The answer is yes, absolutely. Okay. Now, since you've got an antenna that's linearly polarized, you're only going to pick up half the energy. If you had a circularly polarized antenna, you could pick up all the energy, but you might be receiving the extraordinary wave instead of the ordinary wave, and it would be polarized in the opposite direction, which would create a problem, which is why we use linearly polarized antennas. They pick up both of these. Now, I want to show this. This is a 24-hour cycle of an ionosond showing the nighttime here. Now it's getting, um, let's see, I'm not sure if that's local Vandenberg time or if it's during the day. This looks like during the night. Okay, so you see that the ionosphere varies a lot and quickly. So some final thoughts, Ionos the ionosphere is critical to ham radio HF communications. Now hams tend to take it as it comes. You know, we're thinking, oh, conditions are good today, or they're not good today, or it's nighttime, so I'll try, or uh, the sunspot number is good today, whatever. It's a very folklore type of interpretation of radio propagation. We don't try to predict it because we'd need all of this data to do that. Now, commercial and military users need much more precise propagation predictions. And the study of the ionosphere is important to understanding space physics. After all, a lot of our satellites, including the International Space Station, are orbiting the Earth in, that's right, in the ionosphere. The ionosphere is so thin that it's not slowing the ISS down very much. It is slowing it a little, 
but not very much. And it's enough that they can compensate for uh, periodically. So um, if there are strange things that are going to happen with the ionosphere, like a geomagnetic storm, uh, the people on the ISS want to know that so they can take certain uh, preemptive measures. Now, space weather, which is what we're talking about here, uh, this plus what the sun is doing, we take the ionosphere as kind of a, an outcome of what the sun is doing, and space weather also includes other outcomes like geomagnetic storms and so on, and uh, the amount of uh, debris that the sun is emitting that's called the solar wind. Space weather has important side effects on terrestrial communications and electricity distribution. A big space storm can actually induce high voltages in long transmission lines. And so the um, utility companies have to put special uh, things in place to keep that from causing damage to their large transformers. If they don't, their large transformers could easily be damaged by these transient effects. So there you have it. A little bit of stuff about the ionosphere, uh, what it does, who discovered it, uh, things like that. And now you know what those funny bleeps are that you hear on HF or that you see on your waterfall diagrams. If you think that's weird, I want to show you something else that's weird. This comes from my aircraft. I found this cable, was working with the mechanic, found this cable cut and so we started tracing it to see where it would go and lo and behold it came up to two suction cups and a little antenna a little antenna looks like about the size of a GPS antenna I have no idea what this is or what it's for because it doesn't connect to anything so see even outside of ham radio, you can come up upon funny things involving antennas. So I hope you enjoyed that video and have a better understanding of what's going on. And we'll look for those on your uh, waterfall. And now you know what they are. Uh, you can do uh, internet searches and find the space weather where it comes from. All of the data from these various ionosons is made public. And so you get a worldwide picture of what's happening with the ionosphere. It's very cool, really. So if you would like to support this channel financially, you certainly can. Go to decastlercom support to look for various ways that you can do that. Also, please subscribe and please click like. We're getting tantalizingly close to 100,000 subscribers. I'm at 88, almost 89,000 right now, and the rate is going up at about 2,500 a month. So until we next meet, 73.